Oh, thank you very much. I didn't realize I was going to do a tech demo, but that's great, so that's fine. Uh, what we're going to talk about is this. We're going to talk about the importance of educational materials and their movement from this stuff, being made out of this stuff, to being made out of this stuff, right? And that's a pretty big transformation, and we call it uh, the movement from trees to bits, right? You're moving from mashed up organic material to something that's really digital. And what I hope to convince you is, one, that this is very natural, therefore this is going to be inevitable. It's going to be inevitable in schools, it's going to be inevitable in our culture. And the other thing is that it's more than a shift of medium for students, it's a whole shift in thinking. And that's profound. And if you follow medium and what mediums do and when it hits the brain, you know, this is probably also pretty inevitable. But that's how that stuff works. Anyway, so the other thing is this is better for teaching and learning. It's a thing we want to have happen in schools. And that even though it's better and even though it's inevitable, there are still these obstacles that we have to overcome, which is why you in this room are really important, because we can make stuff happen quicker if you all buy in and you understand it, because a lot of this is still tied up in ways that um, you're very important in. So let's get started and see what it looks like. Um, we've been printing on stuff for a very long time, right? Printing, painting, embossing, doing all this stuff. And so we seem to think somehow that this material is natural, that, uh, that reading, that decoding is somehow part of us, but it's really not true. We're much older than this stuff, right? We were, much, we were designed much before we started doing this. And as long as there's been this kind of material, there have been problems with it, right? So <laughs> now, this is a very loose translation. I don't want you to think it's wrong, but this is probably the oldest thing that we as people have printed up. It was the Book of the Dead. Um, this is actually the, uh, the devourer of the dead, not to be trifled with, but uh, that's how it works. But the Sumerians, one of the first literate cultures, in the reading classes, beatings were a regular part of it. Because it's, and it's, it's because when you want to do this stuff, all these parts of the brain that aren't supposed to work together are forced, forced to work together when you want to do decoding. And it's very different. This is much more what we were designed for, right? The, looking at this and the motion and the sound. It's hard to hear the sound, but there's sound here. And if you look at this carefully, the camera's moving, but you're going to see something coming out of the water that's pretty significant. And, and I don't have to tell you that because you're designed for this, right? It could be predator, it could be prey, it could be any of those things. No, there's nothing coming out of the water. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying, I don't have to tell you this stuff because it's the way you're wired. Anyway, nothing's coming out of there. This stuff, in fact, when you try to do this in your heads, it's much more difficult. Uh, a different part of the brain fires up when you're reading English than when you read Chinese. Uh, one guy that read both languages had a stroke. He could continue to read in English, but not in Chinese. It's a very neurological tap dance, and the reality is this. The reality is, what is, what is that? <laughs> what does that say? Seriously. Not really, but it's, uh, you get the idea. <laughs> and the truth is that it's very arbitrary what we make these little squiggles say, right? I mean, wh who decides what kind of meaning gets attached to that? And that's sort of what it's all about. And this all seems fine because, you know, they're good readers and bad readers have always been that. And, you know, people like to read or they don't like to read so much. But what about when you teach other things? When you try to teach conceptual stuff, conceptual stuff that has nothing to do with really decoding? Like, like these, what are these subjects? Yeah, see, and those of you that... <laughs> Those of you that didn't believe it, it's like, what's wrong with you? This is an easy one, right? Anyway, I know what you're thinking, though. It does have a heavy reliance on this, or, or like to say, Fajnik, which is uh, which is because uh, the B is silent. Anyway, the the notion is that we do have to do a lot of decoding. You get to these, and we really shouldn't. It's not natural, and it's why we're so far behind, really, in learning all those things. And a lot of data has come out about kids, and it's not going to surprise you. The fact that the brain has to wire itself sort of to do reading, and in a culture of media, the media is sort of rewiring it back the way that's more natural. So about uh, a few years ago, people started looking at uh, data with children and saying things like, you know what, they're just not paying attention. They're not, these are the same kids that could spend two hours in a video game, right? Is they're not paying attention to this stuff that we give them in school. So old school researchers would say, well, these are problems, right? This is a, there's a problem here. And here's an important one. And, and all you have to read is the big red ones. I mean, I know we're in the 21st century, so I just, I made the ones big and red, right? Because we can do that with electronic media. But look at this. Every hour of watching TV, media increases these attention problems. In other words, 
changes the way you pay attention by about 10%. That's the odds of having that happen. So Kaiser Family Foundation basically said that the average amount of media kids using today is seven and a half, basically eight hours a day. Minority kids, even more than that. So if you do the math, it means that there's about an 80% chance that kids have a different way of paying attention, right? So that's something we maybe should pay attention to. So that's how that works. So here's uh, the other thing. It's not just children. It's some of you, and maybe you've observed this in yourself. This is a somewhat controversial article written in The Atlantic uh, by Nicholas Carr. But he said, you know, I'm not thinking the way I used to think. You know, he said, it's the internet. It's changing the way I think. And this group in England said, you know what? New forms of reading are emerging. It's clear that's true. How many of you have noticed that in your own selves, right? It's just different. And it's because you're going back to the way that was probably more natural. And it's really weird that that happens, but that's what's happening. So the, in education, finally the thinking of the people that observe these things are thinking, you know what? Why should we fight it? Why don't we, if they have a new brain, let's develop a new way of teaching? If they have a wire to learn in a different way, let's do that. And the fact is that they have this extraordinary potential. And really, if we start teaching them in the way they're wired to learn, we'll teach them faster, we'll teach them more effectively, they'll remember it better, and actually they'll even test better. All this stuff is stuff that we know. So why does then the education, the, the adult establishment really is attached to reading. I'm just telling you, it really, really is. And I think I know why. So let's do this exercise right now. <laughs> This is, these are sort of, you know, our, our primate brothers. We're all primates, right? So I want you to imagine that we are all the people in the universe, right? Just us. Just us. And the person in front of you, sitting right in front of you, is the most important person in this whole universe, right? You happen to be sitting right behind that person. The person that can get you food. The person that can get you a mate. The person that can get you offspring, right? That's a, so how do you make an impression on them? Well, Let's say all this debris is coming down, right? There's a lot of debris. So the person in front of you, what I want you to do is do what our primate brothers do. And I want you just to pick, and we'll do this imaginarily, right? I want you to pick stuff up. This is not the 60s. Don't touch the person, right? We have lawyers now. It's the 21st century. So really, I want you to take your hands. I can see you. I taught middle school. So you have, you have hands? You in the front row, it's going to be harder because uh, it has to be an imaginary person. But we're in a culture that really has a tradition of making imaginary people powerful. So I want you to, to do that. So you, in the front, Tom, you have to do this. You have to, so uh, in back of you, you have to, this is the most, this is your chance. So what do you do? You're not, gonna just, you're not giving them a massage. You're taking the stuff off, right? Taking the stuff off. So you do this, right? And then they're, they're letting you do it. Ooh, I've got power. This person's letting me do it. Ooh, ooh. And so we say, well, I'll push it a little bit more. Take your non-dominant hand, which is probably your left hand, except for you, and you kind of cradle the hand. And now you're just stroking the fur because you know what? It was all, it's all messed up, so you do this, and you're doing this, and hey, more power, and look, look, lift your hands up. What are you doing here? You're doing this, right? You're doing this. And this is sort of that physical structure that every culture does when it reads. They do this and this. So does that make sense? Well, look at this. Fiction is 72% of the bestsellers. Look at what it's all about. Powerful people, vampires, be on my side, be on my side. I mean, that's the way that works. This is the uh, best-selling list. This is, uh, this is uh, three years ago. Here's uh, last year. Again, more vampires be on my side, but other people too. Look, a smart uh, professor of archaeology. Hey, I want you on my team too. So we, you know, we just do this stuff. And particularly with electronic books, you could advance it with a button, right? But everybody likes to do this. And I think that's why. Here's the last one. Look, a smart Swedish uh, investigator. We want that person even George Bush is there. So that's uh, the kind of person that we want to do. So I think it's sort of a deep part of how we are. I think it's interesting that the Gutenberg Project, which has been giving away uh, free books for a very long time, uh, 40 years in fact, the number two book on the, the list is The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, somebody you really want, right, on your side. The number one book is the Kama Sutra. So you can put your hands, <laughs> you can put your hands back in your lap. It's not, uh, we don't need, so that's, anyway, so there really is a deep difference between that, between learning in that way, whether it's part of our social you know, networking part or not. There's a big difference between that and this. So this is from Dean uh, Shiresky, uh, who put it up on Twitter, a friend of mine in Canada. And look at the difference this is. These are children who are learning from a device that has them in it, right? This is the camera inside looking at them. From now on, learning will come we're going to look at the solar system later, some other stuff, comes from a thing that, that is them, 
right? It's their face. That's really a different thing. And as they get involved in this, it means that learning is coming from somewhere else. You're not going to have a Sumerian there caning you, you know, because you're not, you don't want to look at yourself. Everyone wants to look at themselves, and that's the way that works. This is, this is a, a, a class in Napa. They have a one-to-one -one experiment in iPads. Um, and this is, these are kids, uh, second language learners, all of them. And they wanted to give them iPads to see if that could help jumpstart the, you know, narrow the difference between their reading and the, uh, and the other kids. So they did that, and it's a, it's, I, I'm Skyping in, right? So I'm taking pictures as I'm Skyping in. And it's a regular, kinder, you know, pre, it's a preschool. Regular preschool class, they've got the buckets. Kids put the buckets on their head. I mean, that's how, so, and then they bring out that part of the day when they're bringing up their well, yeah. And it's hard to hear. So here's what she says. Are you, guys, are you are walking in? Do you remember what to do? She's saying this to four-year-olds, right? It's the same stuff you had to do when you got to log in at this day. I was at the NEA last week with some very smart adults. We had exactly the same conversation with their iPads. So that's the way that can happen. And did it work? Yes. In four weeks, in a one-to-one -one experience with these second language learning four-year-olds, their reading comprehension went from 58.5% to 76.4. And that's, again, a big hop because it's a, this profound difference in the way they're getting their information. So if you have a kid, how many of you have observed this, by the way, with children or grandchildren, they seem to have the ability to do all this magical stuff, you have no clue what it is. I mean, that's, that's the way it works. So this is May, and May is three years old, and she's taking a car trip with her mother, uh, two hours, trouble, right, trouble. So the, the problem seemed to be solved because she loved this certain character, and they just got the, the new DVD, right, so they're watching the DVD. 25 minutes into the drive, she says, the words you hate to hear, are we there yet? It's like, you just got a DVD you've never seen with those people you love. Well, the next trip that they took was in a blizzard, right? This is on the East Coast, a big blizzard. It's now a five-hour trip going home. Don't go to the bathroom, don't drink water, all that stuff. <laughs> so she gave the kid, three years old, her iPad, her iPad. Not a peep for five hours. So she turns around thinking, is this as asphyxiation? What's happening in the back, right? She says, what are you doing? I'm looking at pictures, you know, me, people like me. Me, people like me, all that kind of stuff, playing some games, doing all that kind of stuff, but not a peep. And again, it's a very different thing when you start to get your information in that way. So these are the kids that deserve books like this. These are, these are things that are out there now, the stuff I'm going to show you. So you want something that's nonlinear. You want something that you can kind of zip in and out of and see what it looks like. Or if you get to the section on the moon, in 1968, isn't it nice if it astronauts on Apollo 8 saw something that no other human had seen before. They saw the far side of the, the moon is, for the And the answer is, yes, it's a very time. good thing. I'm going to stop the, the video. The far but, side of uh, the moon. Reading, when you hear it orally, it goes in the brain an entirely different way. Socrates hated reading. He said if you, they learn to read, they're not going to know how to think anymore, right? The ancient Indians didn't like the reading part. It's not something that we've always had. And if you think about it, uh, maybe there's some truth to that. So here's an interactive glossary. And, yes, you can... Uh, you can look at it in words, you can read it in English or in Spanish, but you can also look at an animation. So this is what amplitude is. You know what amplitude is? Well, this, is this is what it is. Now you know. It's a difference, you know, in the, it's the height of a, of a wave. And it's not just the waves are in water. Guess what else is a wave, and that is light. So all of this comes rather than looking up the traditional glossary term of what it is. And this is why when districts states, small schools, make adoptions of material like this, they get this big hop in scores. And that's, this is part of the reason why. So videos, here's another thing, like here's an earthquake project, right? Here's the, um, here's the, the power, the magnitude on a scale uh, that they measure earthquakes. So what, seven to nine, what is, it's like if it's donuts, two more donuts, seven donuts versus nine, but it's not, is it? The scale's different. What, what is that kind of scale? Yeah, it's logarithmic. Somebody always knows. There's some, I gotta say, Many more people in this room knew than usually know when you talk about this. So, yes, logarithm. And somebody, somebody's going, well, what's that again? That's like... Anyway, this logarithmic, and it means that uh, maybe we have a chart that shows it. But why not do something like this where you can actually have a design where you can look around and say, this is the power of these earthquakes, right? This is what it really looks like. And isn't that clearer to see it that way? Can I get at least one? Oh, is that... yeah. okay. Anyway. Thank you. So... <laughs> oh, that's good. We have to do that again. Anyway, so this is... This is something, again, that's out there now, and if I say to a child, okay, um, what I'd like you to do is now uh, add the Alaskan quake to this, 
I want you to design, this was Google SketchUp, it's free, kids teach it to themselves. You design it, say, you build a new one, so you show me what the Alaskan earthquake would have looked like on this scale. And it's a whole different kind of thing. And as uh, somebody that taught math, I will tell you, it's so much more fun to do it in this way. I mean, it m makes these terms make sense. Okay, so that's one thing. Here's another thing that's, that's kind of cool. Did you ever have encyclopedias as a kid? Remember the, the, the pages where you turned and they were like the transparencies? Those are the coolest part, right? Once when I was very young, I sold those door to door, and that's the part you always showed, right? That's the part. So here, now that we're in a digital world, when we start to look at stuff, we can do this. So you can kind of, you go in, right? And you can take a part, you move it around a little bit, you just kind of turn it. If you tap on a single, single structure, you get, these are the pulmonary articles, you tap outside, and you're gonna go and get it back. And the other part is, look, you can actually zoom inside zoom inside the heart. Is this not cool? So you can zoom in, look around, look, there's a, uh, there's a valve, what's on the other side of that valve? And that really is a pretty interesting way to learn about this. And that's, uh, anyway, that's something else that can really work. And if you think about, you know, how you pinch in to make it bigger and smaller and you wonder, how did they get that gesture? I think really the answer is this. I think it's the same. <laughs> We, we go back to the fundamentals, right? So bigger, smaller. Didn't you think that was just Steve Jobs thought of that? Anyway, so pretty cool stuff. So if this stuff is this neat, what are the obstacles really? How come, don't you think this is a, a clear way to go, right? So I'll tell you another secret. Books in this way, tech books, are cheaper than the traditional textbooks. Cheaper, what, in this age? Oh, this should really, we should, this should all be on fire. But it's not, and here's some of the obstacles. Part of it is structural, part of it's human nature. And here's part of human nature. If you walk around and you've got a digital tech book for sale, you've got this, right? You've, uh, people say, okay, um, where's the stuff? It's what I like to call palate envy, right? It's like, <laughs> well, look, the guy from the publisher gives us all this stuff, and you give us, like, nothing. What do you got? It's like, well, I have this. I have this. It's like, so where's the stuff? You know, you have the wire frame with all the student stuff on it and all the teacher stuff on it, and it's like, oh, this is... This is traditional. And that's what a gatekeeper has always done. They've looked at the stuff and said, this is right, this is wrong. So who, who are these gatekeepers? Are there people really standing between students and effective materials? Well, this is the adoption states. This is a map of the adoption states. And you can see that all these in blue have a gatekeeper that comes in and goes, hey, how are you, and what's this stuff? And there are all these, these strange laws that can affect the way that this works. In, uh, in some states, uh, if you present digital material to, uh, to um, stuff, and then people will say, hey, um, you can't change it after the, the law, after the adoption's made. In other words, you can't update it, even though you can update it on the internet. That's the law. Anyways, weird like that. So Indiana started the ball. They changed the rules. They changed the laws in these states. We're sort of rolling in a good way. But let me tell you, there's still systematic structures, six and seven year adoption cycles. That'll kill you, right, if you have organic stuff. And even in a great place like this, even in a great place like TED, there are structural things that you need to see. So this is just for the people in this room. <laughs> so this is going to be edited out. I don't know if you know that they actually edit these things. That's why they're so good. They take out you know, the other parts, so they edit. So this is what I want you to know. One, there are structural parts of doing a presentation here. One, um, it has to be a certain time length, right? And they're very tough about that. They said, originally said, 10 minutes. And I said, what? And they said, go to this little how to do a TED talk, and it explains it. It was 14 minutes long. So they gave me 14 <laughs> minutes. And the other thing is like, um, we have to submit the slides a week in advance. So what does that mean? It means that when I, when I turned it in, this was a good guess, right? <laughs> Not a good guess now. More obviously, maybe this one. But that's how, that's how that stuff works. So anyway, that ends the edit. So here's where my handouts are. But this is the create section. So you want to create something really fast? All right, so this is going to be fast. So here we go. We're going to turn this on. One second. Say, look, here's, a, here's, a, uh, here's Jupiter, right? Are you bringing this up? Yeah, here we go. So here's Jupiter. This is a typical kind of uh, tech book, right? Look. Isn't that cool? Here's the other part. I can actually attach a $3 microscope that I got from Amazon to my book. And then suddenly, I can look in the camera, zoom in, and... Look at this stuff on this $5 bill. Here we go. So there's a $5. Did you know that on the back of a $5 bill, the states are written up above, the, uh, up above that? Anyway, so all this is cool. Not as cool as what we're going to do now. With, with uh, John's permission, we're actually going to build a tech book from the material you have. Isn't that cool, though? Isn't that stuff cool? Three bucks. Anyway, that's how, uh, that's how it works. So now we're going to do this. You should have gotten an email 
that said, we want to help you build a book right here. So we're going to do this, and we're going to build very, this is going to be like a cooking show. If we had more time, we'd do this uh, uh, for 100% real, but this is what we've got. So here's, here's the thing. We wanted to make a book, and I wanted to show you how immediate this material can be, so I asked you to send me a video via the internet, right? Make a video on your phone. You got that email, right? So here are the people that did it. So here's our, uh, here's our uh, tech book, the TED tech book. And uh, ahead of time, that's from the TED site. We grabbed that in video. We also have the uh, video. We could do text, so I grabbed some text. We've got images. We can grab images from any of these places. We could get videos, but I decided to get videos from you. So these are all the people that submitted videos. This is the first one, right? Somebody recognize your stuff, right? So children did more than adults, of course. Uh, one on meditation, one on uh, investigative reporting, and some other stuff. Very cool. So the one I picked was the one that will match with this, and I think you'll see why in a second. So here's some material I've already gathered, uh, all right stream of stuff. Here's some, uh, some text, and let's clear out the way here for, um, for the video that I'm going to bring in. So now I've got the pictures. I'm squeezing this around, and I'm doing this in the magical software PowerPoint. So let's go in and let's grab a movie from the file. And here it is. This is the uh, video that was sent in by somebody. I see them sitting in the front row. <laughs> and here it is. It's on spiders. So we've just built, the last thing we'll do is look at this book. But now we've built a book. And the book um, has not only uh, the text on it and uh, a lot about uh, species and all that other good stuff, predation. But we've also got this, which is the video about spiders sent in by one of you guys. Spiders are not the dangerous and harmful creatures that most people think they are. They are mostly harmless and helpful. They eat tons of the bugs that we most despise and want to get rid of. Flies, mosquitoes, and gnats. Spiders are it. generally harmless, beautiful, and helpful. There we go. So I got you. We built that. A community can build a book. Thank you very much for your time. Digital Prince Book. Thanks, John. Thank you very much.